Hi, my name is Dr. Asif Ali, and thank you for having me today to speak to you. I'm a clinical assistant professor at the McGovern School of Medicine here at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston, Texas. And my area of interest is in med tech, uh, digital transformation, and preventative cardiovascular medicine. I'm here on behalf of Zoll for the American College of Cardiology 2021 Industry Expert Theater to talk about the topic, what you don't know can't help them, uh, remote patient management using wearables. And in particular, in this talk, uh, we'll be talking about regarding Zoll's wearable cardiac defibrillator uh, known as LifeS. The talk is about clinical decision-making based on digital health transformation, utilizing Zoll's LifeS and its digital diagnostic platform. So here are my disclosures. And as an agenda, um, we know that virtual care has become the new normal in this COVID pandem pandemic era. What I'd like to cover this morning is how we have adapted in digital health transformation to meet the healthcare needs of our consumers, our patients. We will discuss about the third leading cause of death in the United States, sudden cardiac arrest, and talk about guideline-directed medical therapy that includes medications as well as wearable cardiac defibrillators and tie in remote patient monitoring and management as a whole. So we're here to talk about sudden cardiac arrest. And I want to discuss how wearable devices, especially during this COVID era, uh, wearable devices have become very um, pop culture. Uh, patients are wearing devices day to day. It's become sort of a new norm on how we collect data. But there's a big difference between consumer products versus FDA medical cleared products, as you know. And there's been an acceleration in telemedicine that occurred with this COVID pandemic, with CMS increasing coverage in scope and frequency to allow patients to access healthcare when and where they need it, especially from non-clinical sites, like from patients' homes. In addition, the adoption of wearables by consumers, as I said, has become a new norm and a convenient way out of the healthcare bricks and mortars to obtain valuable information for healthcare providers to make clinical decision-making on the go. While there's still many barriers to face like compliance, interoperability, and further expansion of parity laws, for example, we've come a long way in warp speed adapting during the COVID era in digital health transformation. The wearable device that I'd like to discuss in today's talk is a device that's been around for 20 years. That is a wearable cardiac defibrillator or the life vest from Seoul. As you know, life vest primary function is to protect patients that are at an increased risk for sudden cardiac arrest. However, there are a number of other capabilities that the life vest does that can maximize the value beyond the shock. As a therapeutic device, life vest is also equally a diagnostic device that can be utilized within the RPM space. So let's take a step back and just understand the prevalence of sudden cardiac death. Well, in one year alone, 475,000 Americans die from cardiac arrest, representing the third leading cause of death in the United States. Sudden cardiac arrest and is a sudden and unexpected pulseless condition strikes about 356,000 patients out of hospitals every year in the United States. And we know about 92,000 or rather 92% of the victims uh, that die represents about a 10% survival rate. I mean, we know that for every one minute that we don't get a defibrillator on a patient that uh, we have an increased mortality of 10% per minute. And this and sudden cardiac arrest really does represent um, a higher uh, prevalence than patients who've died cumulative from Alzheimer's, assaults with firearms, breast cancer, cervical colorectal, diabetes, HIV, house fires, um, and the list goes on. So it's a, it's a 
high prevalence. And that prevalence and the location is important uh, because uh, most of the patients who are having arrest are um, at their home or in their residence or at a nursing home. So the location is important uh, just in regards to uh, first responders and ability to have that first shock uh, within a reasonable time period. And that we know that without um, being seen that uh, arrests, uh, witness arrests um, are, are only uh, less than 50 or 50%. So 50-50 chance that um, you'll have someone who actually um, sees that arrest. And without um, having access to uh, uh, emergency services, uh, patients, that's why we have this low um, incidence of, uh, of actually survival. Okay, so looking at sudden cardiac arrest and post-MI with reduced ejection fraction, this was the uh, Valiant trial. And it was a drug trial that enrolled over 14,000 patients with a recent MI. And it looked at sudden cardiac arrest event rates to determine when the highest risk period was for sudden cardiac arrest. So this was initially a drug trial with over 14,000 patients that had a recent MI. And it analyzed the data to look at the rate of sudden cardiac arrest and the timing when it happened in relationship to the, to the MI. And shown in this graph, patients were stratified by ejection fraction percentage. And it found that those patients with low EF had the highest risk for sudden cardiac arrest. And the highest risk was in the first 30 to 90 days, as you can see here. And in post MI patients plus heart failure, they had four to six fold risk of sudden cardiac death within the first 30 days post MI. And subsequently, there've been several other studies that have also validated and established that in particular patients that are post MI with a low EF have a high risk for sudden cardiac arrest. And so if we look at the clinical course of heart failure, we know that with the new onset of heart failure, represents the highest risk for sudden cardiac arrest, meaning that sudden cardiac arrest is, happens early after the onset of heart failure. After the initial drop in cardiac output, the body attempts to compensate, as we know, increase adrenergic response, increase sympathetic nervous system response, increase RAS, et cetera. And this leads to remodeling. And an increase in arrhythmic risk is seen until we start guideline-directed medical therapy that doesn't just include medications, but also wearable defibrillators. And it is onboarding of these, uh, of the correct guideline-directed medical therapies and also optimization of those medications that are key. And we have to uh, have enough time uh, to transpire for remodeling to occur. And this takes some time. And the point is during this early phase after initial onset of heart failure, that is where the maximum protection from sudden cardiac arrest is critical. The maximum protection is needed to mitigate sudden cardiac uh, death. And so the question as we look at this slide is on the onset of heart failure and the increased risk in that 90 day vulnerable period of time. Uh, once we can get our patients through this time period um, then we're working on patients to optimize medications to reduce the risk of decompensation in the heart failure. And as we decompensate, we have increased uh, intensity of care. And as you know, rehospitalizations increase mortality. And we get to a point where the pump starts to fail. And so we, in those decompensations and transition to pump failure, we're making decisions whether we have to do heart transplant or palliative care may be an option with hospice, depending how the patient's clinical courses and uh, other comorbidities. So the question is, could we decrease these compensations um, if we had better, better control of the biometric data? Other questions would be, how can we involve patients to be more active and how can we provide clinicians with improved decision-making based on data acquisition and analytics. 
And so looking at heart failure as a whole, the scope of the problem, unfortunately, there is still a staggering number of patients in the US that uh, suffer from heart failure and it's only growing. Um, US prevalence around 6.5 million with the estimate that it will increase to around 8.5 million in just under 10 years. And the mortality rate, uh, of course, remains high as we talked about 50, up to 50% mortality in five years. So it, as we have uh, patients going through the course, the clinical course of their heart failure, um, re repeat hospitalizations predict mortality. Mortality increases with each additional heart failure hospitalization, which means readmissions are not a benign event. Readmissions are costly to the patient from a clinical perspective, but also financially as well, costing the healthcare system over $30 billion. And if we look at the course of decompensation in patients with acute decompensation, um, what are our current management strategies? Well, currently, um, typically we send patients out to collect uh, daily weights, uh, blood pressure, and symptom tracking. Inherent, one of the big barriers here is we're putting the, uh, the weights on the patients to collect that data. Um, and then, you know, compliance is a main, is a big issue and a big barrier in uh, acquiring that information. But also if we look at the time course of decompensation, what we're asking patients uh, physiologically, if we look at physiological markers, um, well, by the time patients have weight changes, uh, decompensation is already happening in the late stages. Um, early, much earlier on, we could look at filling pressures and autonomic adaptations and intrathoracic impedance uh, changes, which would give us more uh, pre-symptomatic uh, information rather than uh, waiting till complete decompensation of the patients. And let's look at sort of that workflow in relations to remote patient monitoring, uh, which has become a, a mainstay in uh, many of the uh, core morbid conditions uh, that CMS has put out. So we know that readmissions are costly and strategies have been uh, adopted, uh, adapted to meet that need. Again, um, allowing patients to obtain uh, healthcare when and where they need it but let's, let's kind of go through the, the slide here of how a patient's journey uh, is in remote patient monitoring. Well, it takes the patient in a decompensated or uh, new onset of heart failure with um, uh, high prevalence uh, in those first 90 days of a sudden cardiac arrest. And we are giving uh, the patient uh, uh, having to collect their uh, data and transmit their data so that data analysis and predictions can occur. And then that whole uh, information has to be then reviewed by a care team and clinical actions have to be made. And then the patient has to be informed. So there's data acquisition, there's data analytics, there's communication, and there's a lot of areas where uh, items in this workflow can be dropped. And so the question is, you know, how do we, um, try to collect the data and still do this remotely without uh, putting the burden on the patient to acquire that data. So the real question is, you know, what, what can we do uh, better? And um, so here is one uh, option and one availability to patients um, if they meet the indication, which we'll go over in a minute. But we know that Zoll as a whole uh, has been around for 20 years in regards to the life, life fast. And the question is, um, how do we obtain data from patients um, where we're obtaining data where the patients don't even know we're obtaining data? Um, as long as they're wearing the wearable device, um, as we think about life fast and Zola as a whole, we think about it as more of a therapy. But um, it's actually not just a therapeutic device, it is a diagnostic device. And I, I think that's important because as long as the patient's wearing the device with intention to treat, um, then we're able to actually obtain the diagnostic data that we need. And I'm gonna go over what that diagnostic data is in subsequent slides. And so again, the title um, 
wearable devices can tell you what your patients can't. And we can obtain that data um, so that we can make better clinical decisions as a patient journeys through their heart failure. So what are the indications for uh, wearable cardiac defibrillator life fast? Um, it's really the basic question is who's at in, who are the patients at increased risk for sudden cardiac arrest? Those are typically our post-MI patients or post-intervention patients from PCI cabbage or newly diagnosed heart failure, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients with EFs, all with less than 35% um, that confers a higher mortality, um, especially after a cardiac event. And so um, the, the question is, how do we reduce sudden cardiac risk? Well, let's go to the guidelines and both ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy patients and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, the guidelines um, are there as a 2B uh, indication for both uh, etiologies. And if we look at the new ACC guidelines that just came out in January of 2021, which was an update from 2017, uh, we, all, we all know now that ARNIs are preferred over ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Of course, there's a combination ARB, ARNI now on the market and the use of SGLT2 inhibitors um, for care of our patients with or without uh, diabetes. We know there are other um, agents that have come out pre in previous years, like Ibavardine for heart rates above 70, and also in African-Americans using isosorbide dinitrate and uh, hydralazine. And an important new update also in um, heart failure, as well as um, in patient care in general, and that is shared decision-making which is a class one indication. And it is, it is based on uh, available evidence that we have today, meeting the patient's health goals, preferences, and values. So we have to take into account that patients are on board in regards to um, this shared decision-making and explaining to them what guideline-directed medical therapies are, which would be medications as well as a wearable cardiac defibrillator device. And so the question uh, also arises, do medications alone or medications as a whole address the risk of setting cardiac death? And the answer is yes, of course, we have uh, plenty of trials that show that medications are effective to address all cause mortality and sudden cardiac death. But there are a couple of factors to consider as we're onboarding patients using guideline-directed medical therapy. One of the biggest areas that we need to take in uh, is the effects of, uh, of guideline-directed medical therapies. These are medications where their effects in mortality uh, manifest after the 40 to 90 day wait period. And so that means that medical optimization also during this first 90 days uh, does take time. We have to have patients start medications, review their, their blood pressures, their heart rates, and we start titrating to optimization. And then of course, patient's compliance is a, an important issue. And we'll talk about that in the next few slides. So this slide just shows medical therapy optimization. I think these are important. These are the three beta blockers and the, the studies behind them, married heart failure, Copernicus and Cebus too. But what I would point out is if you look at each of them, the separation of the curve uh, in regards to mortality benefit occurs um, after that three month uh, waiting period, which is the highest uh, uh, risk for our patients in regards to sudden cardiac arrest uh, with EFs less than 35%. And if we look at other guideline directed mortality benefits, whether it's paradigm heart failure, DAPA heart failure rails, or em emphasis heart failure, again, all extremely beneficial for patients but the separation of curve in regards to mortality benefit is beyond that first 90 day period, the vulnerable period for, for patients. And then we talked about compliance um, and I would say it's not just compliance for the patients, but also um, clinicians writing for guideline directed medical therapy. And you can see in this graph, the, the green would be the optimized dosing 
uh, for eligible patients with HEFREF um, at the recommended dosing. And so it shows that there's a, um, a, a very big lack of, uh, of eligible patients receiving optimized heart failure uh, therapy. And so during this vulnerable uh, waiting period, um, can, we, can we do better and can we protect our patients? And that's where the wearable cardiac defibrillator life vest uh, falls into play. And in patients with the cardiac conditions that we talked about, with an ejection fraction of less than 35%, this is the indication, um, as we're starting initiating and optimizing medical therapy, that we're, we're during this uh, waiting period that we're uh, utilizing a uh, wearable cardiac defibrillator during this time. And the indication post-MI would, without revascularization would be 40 days and, uh, Am I with revascularization, dilated cardiomyopathies, or non ischemic uh, cardiomyopathies, all with EFs of 35% or less? We can see they have the highest uh, risk for sudden cardiac death in that first 90 day period. And that would be the indication uh, for LIFES as a wearable cardiac defibrillator uh, in guideline directed medical therapy. And so, what, what is the data on LIFES for over 20 years? LIFES has provided protection. Uh, it with patients for sudden cardiac death. Um, it's been, been extensively uh, researched more than 20,000 patients. And we can see that when patients wore the life vest, that the results showed significant mortality reduction in those first 90 days, as seen in the 2020 vest per protocol analysis. Um, you can see a 75% uh, reduction in death from any cause and a 62% relative risk reduction with uh, arrhythmic death. So again, um, LifeFest, we're used to seeing LifeFest as, um, as, as just that, a therapy for our patients uh, to reduce mortality who have various cardiac conditions that meet the guidelines uh, to be prescribed a LifeFest. But I wanna shift the discussion to patient data management. This is um, really looking at LifeFest from not just a therapeutic, but also as a diagnostic tool for, our, uh, for us as healthcare providers to make clinical decisions as the patients um, were the device. So remote patient monitoring, um, great paper that came out stating, is it overdue or overused? And we're talking about RPM, uh, remote patient uh, monitoring. And uh, the data has shown that using remote patient monitoring can reduce costs. And um, obviously in this COVID uh, era, uh, improving patient access while we're still obtaining data um, from the patients um, as a whole. And with that, we can really monitor patients for these acute decompensations and create treatment plans um, as we're collecting that data. RPM can improve these clinical out outcomes, uh, reducing downstream healthcare costs and uh, preventing hospital admissions. And of course, there's a lot of data that still needs to be uh, collected, a lot of data that still needs to be uh, validated. But I think the, the point as, as a whole is that patients are now demanding um, healthcare where and when they want it, and we as clinicians need to be able to provide tools so that patients can monitor themselves at home and hopefully gather information uh, far ahead in, um, in these acute decompensations prior than just uh, 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 checking, measuring their weights so that we can um, analyze how patients are doing in their healthcare journey. So I think the, the, the benefits to patient uh, remote uh, patient monitoring are, are very obvious. One, it's all about barriers. Um, barriers could be transportation, could be uh, locations of the patients. And you know, quite frankly, these are uh, sick patients who may not want to come into environments where there's a high prevalence of COVID, uh, which may be in the hospital systems or in, in clinics. Um, patients also, uh, by doing remote patient monitoring are taking ownership. And we talk about compliance, but that ownership is important so that we can look at 
trends and explain it to patients why we're collecting the data. And of course, for providers, we're able to make more informed decisions as we um, obtain uh, more targeted data to target prescription. So that uh, ties into what Zola is doing with its patient data, uh, data management tool known as ZPM. And the Zola patient management system um, is looking at six key factors. And I'll just go ahead and pull them all up at once, and then we'll talk about each of them. So with the uh, in, initially, um, it, it is a wearable device that is collecting um, key information on uh, patients' heart health. So first is an EKG. And I think uh, what's interesting in the Wear It 2 uh, study that out of uh, one out of 14 patients had a significant arrhythmic event that um, uh, was uh, notified to the physician and a decision uh, make a, a decision was made uh, different than what the patient previously had based on those EKG reviews. So having a patient wearing um, a device, as we know, with example, with halters or event monitors, um, it does help us understand that. But I think the difference here is that we're getting data um, ongoing, um, and it's not something that the patient has to turn in, but this is all part of the management system that Zoles has put up so that we do have remote patient monitoring um, within a, a certain time period. And then heart rates. Um, we know that this can be displayed um, up to a five minute uh, trend and heart rates in heart failure, um, ha I think has been very well played out with studies on Ibavardine with heart rates above 70 with um, increased hospitalizations. So knowing the heart rate throughout the course of the first 90 days at least um, is, is vitally important. And I think something interesting with the walk test, six minute walk test has been very validated in other areas like pulmonary hypertension and in heart failure, and that we're able to prescribe and actually push out to our patients a six minute walk test and see how they're doing. Um, many clinicians are doing this on a weekly or, by, or every two weeks, especially when patients are, are in a area of decompensation. And I'll show you that data of how you can do that in a minute here. Uh, body position and activity, I mean, orthopnea is, is a, a key uh, clinical indicator on our patients. So knowing their body position and activity, how many steps they're taking today, are also key factors in helping us understand how patients are doing well beyond just taking weights, but also understanding the patient's body position and uh, reduction or increase in steps per day to understand their clinical course for heart failure. We can also prescribe a, a health survey that is delivered directly to the patient on the LifeVest monitor. So um, this really ties into part of the metrics of RPM, which is actually you know, sending information to patients, have them filled out, and us taking a look at it to make sure uh, how the patient's feeling. And then the wear time, um, I think this is you know, very well played out in the, in the VEST trial. Um, we know that patients who actually wore the live fast, the longer they wore it, um, the more information we were able to gather. And of course, it is a therapeutic. So if the patient were to have an event, uh, they would need to have the live fast to um, incur the benefits. And here's just some examples of real patients that have worn the live fast. We talked about the Wear It 2 trial um, that uh, would uh, be able to establish some EKG reports. And here's some examples of SVT, sinus pauses on sustained VTAC and um, even a Mobitz one. And so the ECG recordings are um, automatically recorded by LifeFast and they can also be manually uh, captured uh, by the patient if they're symptomatic. And there's customizable alerts and notifications uh, uh, to the clinician. And then heart rate uh, control alert, we can actually uh, do an, uh, increments of five minutes. And again, heart rate, uh, heart rate uh, alerts can be set up uh, with thresholds with both maximum uh, and minimum, uh, as well as uh, nocturnal heart rates. And that can help us determine uh, medical optimizations of whether it's a beta blocker or uh, a bavardine. And here is just showing that the heart rates can be displayed as a daily average, and we can drill down to uh, five minute increments. And you can also see 
uh, when an alert was triggered. And here you can see also represented uh, in this, in, represented in these graphs, um, trends of the heart rates, uh, which I think is great when we're trying to medically optimize patients, not just with their blood pressures, but with their heart rates. And I think um, activity reports um, are, are extremely important. Uh, you know, many of us, many patients are wearing um, devices on the wrists or, or, or their phones. Um, but here we have the uh, ability for at least interoperability in the dashboard to have one dashboard that gives us all of this data and the activity uh, reports seeing how, you know, how active patients are, are a predictor for patients' um, heart failure decompensation. And I think body position is, um, you know, is, is, is obvious here. If our, our patients are sitting up at 90 degrees um, all of a sudden or over, over a time period, then um, this is, you know, this is uh, something very valuable to us to uh, establish orthopnea. Um, I did have a, uh, a patient uh, that um, body, body position was um, at 90 degrees after one weekend. And um, we, you know, did call that patient to understand, you know, where we're we going, uh, what, what happened, is there something erroneous with the, with the device or, you know, what was going on with this patient? And they had actually gone to a crawfish broil that weekend in Louisiana, came back to Houston, and for the next um, uh, week was going from 30 degrees, 60 degrees up to 90 degrees. We had an alert and we're able to start talking about the DASH diet with that patient. And then um, walk test alerts. Um, I think this is uh, very interesting. We can actually prescribe a patient a six minute walk test. So if you see that their walking is decreasing, you can establish a walk test early on the course of the heart failure patient and see improvement or decompensations, which again, help us understand, you know, how that patient is, um, is, is, is doing as a whole in regards to their guideline directed medical therapy. And here's just an example of uh, a six minute walk test where you can see the walk test was uh, completed and you can see a summary of the walk test uh, sessions and look at all sorts of data, including their heart rate, maximum heart rates, during that time period. And again, this can be done uh, multiple times and we can um, actually look at previous data and see how that patient's improving or not. And I think as important uh, looking at uh, pre and post walk uh, uh, six minute walk tests is also uh, questionnaires that we can um, uh, send out uh, to the patient. So we can ask them if they're getting short of breath, if they're getting fatigued, and we can correlate that with their um, actual physiological uh, walk tests. And compliance is a big issue. Um, you know, we, we practice medicine, we, we know the guidelines, we write guideline-directed medical therapy, we're doing the shared decision-making. This is all great. But if our patients aren't wearing the devices or are not taking our advice and using the medications, that becomes uh, very difficult. And I've always found that compliance um, is a very hard thing to measure. Uh, we can ask patients, are you taking your medications? Are you being compliant? But there was, there's really um, very difficult to have an objective tool to look at that. Well, um, Zoll actually uh, has the ability to show the compliance of the patient. So here um, you can see the number of days that the patients used it, the total number of hours, and even the average daily patient use in hours. So, um, Again, if the patient's not wearing the device, um, they're not going to be able to capture the data from the diagnostics, and they're not gonna be able to realize uh, if they need it, the therapeutics uh, that, uh, that, that Zoll has. So I think this is very interesting. If we look at uh, CMS as a whole, if you even look at uh, sleep apnea, for example, um, sleep apnea's uh, machines do track uh, compliance of the patients, and if they're not wearing it, then uh, uh, Medicare will uh, not pay for, for that device, device because of patient's compliance. So I think that's a very interesting um, area that's, uh, that uh, uh, payers are entering in, which is patient's compliance and the ability to track that. More importantly, I think what's interesting when you do prescribe a life vest, Zoll in the, at least the first two weeks will, will track this and uh, 
will be uh, reaching out to the patients uh, prospectively to make sure that is there an issue with you know, wearing the device or are they just technically doing it wrong? Um, all sorts of different factors, but I think it is important to point out that Zoll does track that in the first at least two weeks to um, feedback to the patients to make sure that uh, compliance is, is kept. And hopefully in those first two weeks, this becomes habitual and the patient's using the device more often. So um, looking at Zoll uh, wearable patient management tools, um, I think this is um, kind of a summary slide and this is a innovation theater. So kind of talking about um, where we are today um, and where we're uh, looking for in the future. Um, so we talked about Zoll LifeVest as a wearable cardiac defibrillator that offers therapeutics like defibrillation. And I've shown you six parameters, uh, whether it's continuous ECG monitoring, um, looking at biometric data, six minute walk tests, um, doing health surveys with the patient, um, looking at heart rates and managing the patient, uh, not as a, only as a therapeutic, but as a diagnostic so that we can make clinical decision-making. As I teach medical students, I always uh, in, I tell medical students that, and residents and fellows, that when we uh, prescribe or um, write for a test, uh, we should have an idea of what that clinical outcome is gonna be. And it should uh, help us make decisions, clinical decisions on our patients. So I look at all of these wearables as tools that are helping us make decisions, keeping in mind that we are still in this COVID era trying to get vaccinated and uh, that we have devices now that um, can be uh, diagnostic and therapeutic. And then there are other devices uh, like MCT devices and extended ho uh, Holter devices um, like Claris and Era that um, can help uh, our patients if they don't meet indications for EFs of less than 35%, but we're worried about arrhythmias, then um, there are devices out on the market uh, put out by Zoll. And lastly, um, something I think very exciting that is uh, currently out, but with a very limited uh, initial release in certain parts of the US, and I am using it here in uh, the Texas Medical Center in Houston, Texas, which is uh, HFAMS, which is a uh, fluid management system uh, that I have used in patients with EFs uh, above 35%. Uh, so for example, if I have a patient with heart failure and we do guideline directed medical therapy, and in that first 90 days, the EFs have improved, but, they're, but I'm still working on fluid management with the patients. Um, so say EF is now 40%, um, I will put a patch that goes in the left axilla um, known as um, HFAMS that helps with determining many of the data collection tools that we talked about, but including uh, bioimpedance measurements um, so that we can optimize uh, uh, the uh, diuretics in those patients. Um, and so again, and there's AMS that also includes MCT, CM, EH with other biometrics. And uh, again, these are limited uh, in scope of where they're available in the US, but I thought important to mention this uh, management system because we're really looking at heart failure as a big continuum. We know that acute decompensations can occur, acute on chronic decompensations, chronic heart failure, and not just limited to HEFREF, but also HEFPEF. And having the variety of tools to help us manage patients, whether it's from arrhythmic events or bioimpedance uh, uh, metrics and data, um, or all the other wearable cardiac defibrillator data that we talked about, and very important that um, we are able to do this remotely. And um, as patients, uh, you know, I look at healthcare kind of in the future where uh, we're giving the um, devices to the patients to wear and really, the healthcare visit in my office is really just an audit of all this information that we're getting and making those on the fly decision as we're optimizing patients in their uh, healthcare journey in regards to heart failure. So I hope the key takeaways that you had from today's talk 
is that sudden cardiac arrest and heart failure affect millions and is only uh, growing as the projections show. And that wearable cardiac uh, devices um, not only can provide protection from sudden cardiac arrest, but there's other important biometric information that can help us guide guideline directed medical therapy during these wait periods where patients are at their most vulnerable periods in regards to sudden cardiac arrest, and that we can empower uh, clinicians to, uh, with tools to better manage our patients. That remote patient monitoring um, allow for more effective monitoring and continuum of care during the recovery from a cardiac event. And that Zoll offers a suite of wearable cardiac de devices that share arrhythmia biometric information on a single remote patient data management platform. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, I think it's exciting to be in a um, innovation uh, uh, talk and innovation platform. Um, and I appreciate again, the time uh, that we had today and I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you again. So any questions, please um, do put in the chat feature. Um, they don't have the capability to um, add audio for everyone, um, but please do, um, uh, if you have any questions in these last few minutes that we have here, uh, do, do put in the, uh, the chat feature and we'll try to call on you. Um, and I will, as, uh, as I'm waiting for any last questions, um, I have been using uh, uh, LifeS uh, platform um, and have been an early adopter in uh, HFAM. Um, I have found that, you know, this is a, a continuum of offering. Uh, I've had a number of patients with guideline-directed medical therapy, as I'm sure many of you have, uh, that have um, improved their ejection fractions, but are still um, at risk. Uh, you, you know, we, we, we talk about uh, all of the trials, Scott half made it one, made it two, showing increased mortalities with EFs of less than 35%. But, um, you know, as patients improve their EFs on, on all of these amazing new therapies that we've had uh, for um, HEFRAF uh, as well as HEFPAF, um, the, the issue is, is as, as we're getting patients medically optimized, their EFs improve many times not above 50%, maybe they're still down in the you know, upper 30s or low 40s. Um, so there's still active management. We know that these patients can still decompensate. We know that they need to continue their medications. And I look at the spectrum of wearables help us, both if they're vulnerable where they need a diagnostic and a therapeutic like LifeS, or if they're out of that vulnerable period, still at some risk with EFs of uh, less of uh, 40%, for example, mild to moderate heart failure. Uh, but how do we continue accessing this data? And that's where HFAMs and other, um, uh, other devices can help us with um, arrhythmic uh, information, as well as bioimpedance information, as we talked about. And I've had plenty of patients where we've been able to see that they've cheated that weekend, as I talked about someone going to a crawfish broil, and that we can take those ac active management uh, questions, uh, you know, prior to uh, them decompensating and just getting a, um, a a weight from that patient, which would be much further down the pipeline prior to decompensation. So the question uh, that was posed, and um, I think we have a um, short little bit of time here to answer, what does the future look like post COVID? for keeping patients engaged using these kinds of technology? I think it's a great question. So you're talking about engagement and um, I, I, I do this grand rounds on patient consumerism. So if you, if you look at, at a whole, patient consumerism of wearable devices was not a byproduct of, of the medical community. It was started by the consumers, the patients. Um, so if you look at devices like Fitbit or the Apple Watch, um, there have been other devices out there. Um, patients were the ones who engaged to obtain their data and to keep their data and share their data. Well, that, you know, we're, we're talking about consumer-driven products. 
And um, so that's that's one one I think area to be uh, to highlight is that patients are willing to collect their data. Um, the second uh, er- area in this 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 question is that we want to make sure that the data that we're collecting is at a level that we can make clinical decision making. And then how do we actually engage patients, which is a great question. You know, I feel that there needs to be a level of, of, um, uh, of, of engagement uh, where we ask patients or um, even uh, there's a term called gamification where we um, reward patients for collecting their data. And that's really the auspice of RPM where, um, you know, there are parity laws and there are reimbursements. And by the way, I will tell you that there are reimbursements that one can uh, obtain using Zoll's LifeFast because it does, uh, because you are taking care of a chronic uh, uh, condition and you are collecting data and you're prospectively giving uh, opportunities to the patient uh, to answer questions. So that is part of the engagement, that is part of RPM. And to your question, keeping patients engaged is using tools like this where we can give surveys, we can ask patients to do a six minute walk test so they know that they're actively being watched. And that part is uh, part of uh, being connected to the patient remotely and allowing the patient to know that there are people who are looking at their data, that they're interacting with the patient and that interaction, whether it's in person or virtual is going to be key consideration as we move forward. It is tethering the patient to the office and making clinical decision-making based on the questions and asks of the patient as we engage with them. So with that, I thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to speak to you at ACC's Innovation Theater on behalf of Zoll and LifeFest. And I wish you a very good day. Uh, Thank you again.